What's up, nerds and nerdettes and wee little nerdlings all? It's your buddy, Big John and G, the two gun fix it presents Legendary Gaming. Welcome to Big Gen G's How to Play Hero Quest. This is for the 2021 edition of the game, uh, the HasLab update, if you will. Sorry to disappoint you. Huh? You triggered my trap card. So the first thing is, are you a player? Or are you Zargon? Well, I guess you're all players, right? So are you a hero? Or are you Zargon? Zargon is sort of the game master, or dungeon master, as Dungeons and Dragons likes to call it, uh, of the game. He is both the adversary, and she is also the narrator uh, of the game. So it's a different role than just playing the heroes. Now, Zargon is going to be in charge of setting up the table, setting up the quest, and getting everything ready to go. Now, before we get to that, I just want to talk about the heroes, because the players that aren't running Zargon are going to have to choose one of the available heroes, and four of them come with the core game. Let's take a look at them. Now, I'm going to be doing this in the suggested order of combat. Uh, during the course of the game, the player to the left of Zargon will start combat, and it will go around clockwise from there. And the suggestion is the Barbarian, the Dwarf, the Elf, and the Wizard. So that's the order I'm going to be looking at them here for you. The Barbarian is the Powerhouse, comes in with three attack dice and two defense dice. He's the healthiest of all of them, with eight body points, and his mind points are at two. He's going to start the game with a broadsword, but no armor, and as is standard for all of the heroes in the core game, he's going to be using two red dice, or standard d6s, to roll his movement. Looking next at the dwarf, we see that the dwarf has two attack dice and two defense dice, with body points of seven and mind points of three. He started the game with a short sword in hand, no armor, and as per usual for the core heroes, two red dice for movement. Now the elf and the wizard are a little bit different since they utilize spells, but the elf has two and two for his attack dice and defense dice. For the character's body points, there are six, and she has four mind points. Starting the game with a short sword and no armor, and of course rolling two red dice for movement. Now before we get to spells, let me look at the wizard with you. So the wizard is coming in with one attack die and two defense dice. Body points are four, the lowest in the game as you would expect for a wizard, and with the highest mind points of the starting core characters at six. No armor, and starts with a simple dagger. Of course, two red dice for movement. Now, the wizard and the elf both get to use spells. There are four sets of spells based on the four core elements, air, earth, fire, and water. Three spells in each category. The wizard gets first choice of one of the four categories. It suggests, to start the game and to learn the game, that the wizard chooses the fire deck. With the three remaining decks, the elf gets to pick one of them. It suggests to start the elf with the earth elemental spells. And then the final two categories of spells, the water and the air, will go to the wizard. Now the Zargon player is in control of the quest. He sits behind the board and has the quest book, whichever quest book they are running, behind the screen in hand and has preferably read through the entirety of the 10, 12, or 14 quests which happen to be in each of these quest books. At the very least, you should have at least read the current quest that you're doing. The Zargon player uh, behind the screen, besides the quest book, is also going to have a deck of artifact cards 
and their own spell deck, the Dread Spells. The deck of monsters will also be held behind the Hero Quest Game Master board, the Zargon screen, <laughs> uh, along with whatever else he or she may want to put back there, maybe holding some of the miniatures that are going to be used for this particular adventure, or some of the terrain and furniture, uh, if you have room and if you so choose. Zargon will begin the game by reading from the quest book, the part of the quest book that is outlined for him or her to read to the players. Then Zargon will place the starting stairwell or door in some of the future campaigns. Uh, we'll start the placing stairwell in the appropriate placement on the map. Now, as far as the Zargon player goes in sitting at the table, the Zargon player is going to want to sit with the board having the Hero Quest logo to the right of themselves. The Hero Quest logo should be to the right of Zargon. That will help you align for the map, is the main reason that uh, I see that this is really done. And it's quite helpful just looking at the map and looking at your book. You don't have to realign anything in your head. Now, so right away, you're going to place down the stairwell, and the heroes are going to place their figures around the stairwell in the stairwell room. There's going to be one or more doors that are closed off to the players and any other furniture or terrain setting that the map in the quest book outlines will be put in by Zargon to, for that specific room and that specific room only. Unless something is mentioned in the book otherwise. And that's everything for the setup of the Hero Quest game. Now let's move on and see what the turns look like and what can be expected to happen for the player turn and the Zargon turn. Now during the course of the game turn, it begins with the hero players before the Zargon player. The Zargon player should have already have everything set up that needs to be set up to start the game. And then the hero that is left of Zargon will get to start. Now on your hero turn, you have one of two choices. You can move, and then perform an action, or you can perform an action, and then move. In order to move, you're going to roll the appropriate number of six-sided dice, red dice, and you'll be able to move up to a maximum of that score. Now, you can move orthogonally, but diagonally is not allowed. Diagonally isn't the only illegal movement during your turn. You cannot move through monsters, or walls, or items of furniture and terrain. Again, unless the quest book states otherwise for that specific incident. Now, although you cannot share a square with another hero, or monster, or anything else, you can pass through fellow hero squares, as long as you're not stopping on them. You can only enter through rooms using open doors. You cannot pass through walls, unless you're casting a spell. <laughs> All doors that are open will remain open for the entirety of the game unless otherwise noted in the quest book. Now, after or before movement, you have several options for actions that you can take. I do want to point out that looking, such as down a corridor or opening a door or looking through an open door, those are free actions that you can take. They don't cost against your actions. Now, of the six actions that you are able to choose one for, for your turn, because you are only allowed one action, unless a spell or item says otherwise, the first of your choices is to attack. Now, unless a weapon says otherwise, you cannot attack diagonally. It has to be orthogonally. You're going to attack by rolling a number of white dice equal to the number of attack points listed on your character sheet. And when you make that roll, you're looking for skulls. Every skull that you roll is going to be a hit. The number of dice that you're rolling is appropriate to your character, your uh, weapon that you have, and any bonuses because of items or artifacts that you may have uh, collected during the course of the game. That's the number of white dice that you're going to roll to make an attack. Each of the skulls is going to count as a hit. If you get any number of hits at all against the monsters, then they are going to get to roll defense dice. Every monster has a set number of defense dice, just as the players do. They're going to roll that if they get hit. For each black shield that they roll, 
the monster eliminates one of the skulls, one of the hits, from the player's attack. And this, incidentally, works in reverse as well. So when it gets around to the monsters making swings and attacks on you, the heroes, it's going to be the same way. They're looking to roll skulls, and any amount of skulls that they do generate, you're going to have to defend against. And you're looking for white shields. The heroes are looking for the white shield symbols to cancel out the monster attacks. Now, in between quests, and sometimes even in certain rooms, with some treasure that you find, you're going to be able to upgrade your equipment, your weapons, and your armor, and this will affect the number of dice that you're rolling for both your attacks and your defense. Another action that may be chosen is that of spellcasting. Spellcasting, along with any ranged attacks you may have, uh, such as uh, with a crossbow, uh, you are going to have to make sure that you have line of sight. And in this particular game, line of sight is done by center to center straight line point. So on the map, you're going to look at where your hero is, as opposed to where your target monster is, and if you can draw imaginarily, you don't want to put it on the board and ruin your board, perhaps you can use a ruler or the uh, a bookend to represent a straight line. But if you can get a straight line between the center of your square to the center of the target square, then you have line of sight and you can make a ranged spell attack. Walls and closed doors will naturally block line of sight along with furniture. If there's a bookcase between you and the enemy, you're not going to be able to target them. Another action choice that your players have during their turn is to search for treasure. This is simply done by the player saying out loud to the rest of the players, and specifically to Zargon, that they are searching for treasure. They don't have to move their piece around the room. Uh, it, it is implied that they are searching through the room, however. They are looking through cabinets, drawers, underneath chairs, whatever's in the room to actively look through, under, over, on, uh, they are, that's what they're doing. It's implied, but the figure is not moved around the room while this is happening. If there is any such treasure in the room, Zargon will then relate that to the players. If there's no treasure called out for in the quest book, then the players are going to be drawing from the treasure deck. Now, this can be a dangerous option, since it's not always gold and jewels. Sometimes there are hazards, such as spear traps, uh, pit traps, falling ceiling traps, and sometimes it might just be a wandering monster. Now, if it is a wandering monster, the quest book for each particular quest in the series will tell you what the wandering monster is for that particular quest. If a wandering monster does come up, then Zargon is going to place that on the square closest to the hero that was looking for treasure. Uh, if there's no way to uh, put the monster exactly right next to that player, then whatever the nearest open spot closest to that hero is, that's where Zargon is going to put the wandering monster. Now, another action you can take is searching for secret doors, because they're bound to be all over the place. <laughs> At this point, once again, the player simply says out loud around the table, specifically to the Zargon player, that they are searching for secret doors. Once again, don't move your figure around the room or corridor uh, square by square as if you are literally physically searching. Again, it is implied that you're pressing up against the wall, knocking on the wall, uh, feeling for breezes, all of the telltale signs, that's all implied. Uh, and the Zargon player will tell you if there's anything that's found. And he will place the marker on the table where it shows her to put it. Now, keep in mind that just because you find a secret door, it does not imply at all that it is open. In fact, it is specifically closed, again, unless something in the quest book says otherwise. If you want the door to be considered open, then you're going to have to go over, physically move your miniature, over to that spot and let the Zargon player know that you're opening the secret door. And at that point, it will be considered open uh, for all intents and purposes, along with the rest of the doors that you've already opened. Another search action you can take is letting the Zargon player know that you are actively searching for traps, whether it is in a corridor or in a room. You cannot search for traps if there's any active monsters in the room you are in or 
corridor or wherever. You have to be monster and enemy free in order to check for traps. If there are traps there, the Zargon player will let the other players know that yes, there are suspicious spots in this area. Do not reveal the traps yet because they are still unrevealed and unresolved. They haven't been disarmed and they haven't been set off yet. The final action is disarming traps. If you know the location of a trap and you are either a dwarf or a non-dwarf player that has a toolkit, then you can attempt to disarm this trap. Announce to Zargon that you are intentionally moving onto the trap spot in order to disarm it. This way the Zargon player won't blow it up in your face right away. You are then going to roll one combat die. If you roll a skull, you've set off the trap. If you roll anything else, then you have disarmed the trap safely. Now the dwarf handles it just a little bit differently. If the dwarf rolls a black shield, then the trap has been sprung. However, if anything else is rolled, then the dwarf has successfully disarmed the trap. And remember, the dwarf does not need a toolkit in order to do this. Oh, and if you disarm a pit trap, it's then considered a regular piece of the terrain. You don't have to worry about maneuvering around it. Uh, it's just a regular piece of the floor again. Now, after all of the heroes have gone, it's the Zargon player's turn. The Zargon player is able to move any and all of his minions anywhere on the board that she wants, as long as you are meeting the requirement within their maximum movement. It is listed not only on each of the individual monster cards, what their movement is, it's also right there on the Zargon screen in front of you. The monsters don't have to roll dice. They have a set number of movement that they can move up to as a maximum, but they can stop anywhere before that, such as a goblin's 10. He can move three if that goblin needs to, or the full 10. And yes, again, Zargon can do this to every active monster that is on the board. Or just one. Whatever Zargon needs to move, Zargon can move up to their maximum number. And then the Zargon player has two options to either make an attack or to cast a spell. Now the dread spells that come with the game are specific to each and every quest. Some quests have them available and others don't. And the quests that do have them available will tell you specifically what spells can be used and who which monster is able to cast them. There are certain things that monsters can't do. They can't search for treasure or secret doors. They can't just pass through a square that has a hero in it. They can't move through walls and they can't open or close doors. That's kind of important, I think. And also, just like the heroes, they can't share the same square. They can't share the same spot, the same space with another monster or a hero or a piece of furniture or whatever is taking up the space. The attack option is uh, the same as I was talking about with the heroes. So the monsters make an attack. Every skull that they roll is a potential hit. And then the players get to roll the number of defense dice is listed on their character appropriate to their equipment. And for every white shield that a hero rolls, it blocks or counters one of the skull attacks from the monsters. Just like the monsters are going to fall, death is quite a real possibility for the heroes as well. If a hero does die during combat, then you can simply just come back with another hero, or the same hero renamed, the second, the third, maybe he has or she has a family line, uh, and start the, uh, the new adventure with this hero. Now, any equipment that you had when you died can be picked up by these still living heroes. If they want to keep it, that's up to them. If they want to give it back to your character as uh, something, this was your father's sword, this was your mother's sword, or whatever, that's up to them. But the uh, fallen equipment can be collected by heroes, and the fallen hero will come back in the next quest with a new version of that same hero, or maybe you want to try a new hero. Now, if your character reaches zero hit points, you get an attack on you and brings you down to, to zero or less hit points. You don't really count going into less. You know what I mean, though? But if you're left with nothing and you happen to have a potion on you to heal yourself or a spell of healing yourself, 
you can then do that immediately to save yourself. Yourself is the key word here, because if you reach zero hit points on the next hero's turn, they don't have time to rush over to you and give you a potion or cast a spell on you. By the time it takes for the turn to go from you hitting zero to the next player, you're kaput. But you have time to do it yourself on your turn when uh, right there on the spot. You have time to do that. So you can save yourself if you have the appropriate potion or spell. Otherwise, you're kaput and you're starting a new character, same class or different, on the next quest. Now, the monsters, if you've noticed, are sort of color-coded. The undead are, are white, the uh, gargoyle knights uh, are gray, and there's sort of a dark green color for the goblins and orcs. So if you run out of miniatures of a certain color, but you still have other miniatures of that color available, you can make a physical, visual substitute for that. Like if you run out of orcs, but you have goblins left, and you need one more orc, you can use a goblin figure to represent that orc. It's still an orc. It's not using the goblin stats. You're just using it as a visual cue, a proxy to stand in its place. Uh, so that's what you're going to do if you run out of miniatures. God help the players, though, if you're running out of miniatures. <laughs> the end of the quest will be noted by a return to the stairwell or possibly an exit door. And after that, you get to celebrate by going to town and you can spend the hard-earned money by buying and upgrading your equipment and gear, getting ready for the next quest. And that is how you play Hero Quest, the 2021 edition. There you go. Uh, so have fun. This is a great and fantastic game. And we're still waiting for the app to come out. And you're going to be able to run this game solo because the app's going to play Zargon for you. But until then, have fun with you and your group playing some Hero Quest. I'm your buddy, Big John G, for two Gun Pixel Presents! <laughs> Legendary Gaming in Iowa!